Pamona Hall in Camden, New Jersey was built in 1718 and still stands proudly today, 300 years later. This estate was home to the Cooper family for generations, once humble Quakers that became titans of industry. The Coopers left a lasting legacy of success, but also controversy. In this episode, I will be cooking in the kitchen of the grand estate, preparing fricassee of sweetbread and wheel tongue, a stewed pheasant served with rice pilaf, and for dessert, a delectable Madeira Sabayon with fresh food. Pomona Hall's past is on display for this taste of history. Wow, spectacular. A Taste of History is made possible by Sandals Resorts, the luxury included vacation. I'm so excited to be able to cook here. After all, it's 300 years of Pomona Hall, but it's also the 10th season of A Taste of History. And guess what? The first episode of season one was filmed right in this kitchen. Welcome to the 18th century. The first dish I'm making today, and actually the second as well, comes straight out of Hannah Glass's cookbook. Veal tongue and veal sweetbreads were very precious in the 18th century, and it's obvious why. One animal has one tongue, so it was only for the well-to-do people. And if you want to make this recipe at home, you need two things. You need to cook the tongue, which I have on the fire behind me, and peel it. Any animal tongue has a protective skin on the outside, so never worry where this tongue has been. You want to cool it off a little bit, but you do not want it too cool. It'd be very difficult for you to get the, the skin off. So this one over here is extremely hot, as you can imagine. You cook it until you be able to penetrate the tip of the tongue and touch your fingers. And there's nothing better than a piece of tongue. Let me see. Oh, mm. Remind me of the good old days. When I grew up in the Black Forest, this was a feast. Be able to have a real tongue. Mm. Delicious. The sweet bread is already, again, poached. The sweetbread is an item that is forgotten except French restaurants that serve it. And basically it's the glands of the calf. There is nothing better than sweetbread. So for this recipe today, just like so, chop it up. If you cut the sweetbread through it, the membrane is chewable. Now we got to cut up the tongue before the assembly comes. Right here. Okay, now I'm chopping quick a shallot. You could use onion. I happen to like shallots better, a little sweeter for this dish. And you, you kind of cut it fine if you can. And then I'm going to start getting into my spider behind me. I got a butter ready. Take it off the fire and then pull it. Cooking here will test your skills on open heart cooking because you have a fixed hook system versus a swinging hood system. So much more complicated, much more work, but for me, piece of cake. <laughs> Shallots go in there. We're gonna sweat them, no color. So this we're just gonna let simmer. And then we add in the sweet bread. Tongue second. And back on the fire. Okay, now goes the sherry. Now comes cream. So now let it sit for a little bit. While it simmers, I'm gonna get to the mushrooms. I use uh, cremini mushrooms because that's our baby portobello. A uh, little more drier than uh, button mushroom, more flavor. And I think that's just prettier. So all we need to do is bring it back off the fire in a little bit. Now I'm going to transfer it in another pot and finish the seasoning and then dish it up. 
parsley, and a bit of my nutmeg. Pepper, tater salt. All right, so this particular dish I serve in an Adama bread bowl. You want bread that's a little on the stale side. So I baked this bread a couple days ago because when I hollow it out as a bread bowl, I cannot be too soft, so I'll show you. In the 18th century style, you would have most likely served it in one big one versus in small ones. I'm gonna make it a little bit more deeper. So now I just wanna ladle this into your bread bowl. There you go. If you wanna be a little fancy, you can take the bread and cut down the excess. And then you take a big sprig of parsley. I'm not sure if the Coopers would have presented like that, but Hannah Glass surely wrote about it. And now I'm gonna try it over here and I'm gonna get a simpler version, which is a smaller roll. Same concept behind it. You can cut it on a bias, and a bias gives you that, that little indentation that will hold your fricassee. Do the same thing as I did before. So this is the fricassee of sweetbread and veal tongue with cremini mushroom served in an anadama bread that we actually bake in the city tavern every day because it's one of the original 18th century breads. It's cornmeal and molasses, but together, the meat of bread and the fricassee, it's a beautiful eating. Now, let's find out more about the Cooper family legacy. Located directly across the river from Philadelphia is the city of Camden, New Jersey. Although this area is now tightly packed with row homes and businesses, it was once the site of sprawling plantation homes, complete with acres of fields, orchards, and livestock. Pomona Hall, built in 1718, is one of the few remaining buildings of the era still standing today. Pomona Hall is the ancestral home of the Cooper family, who are the founders of Camden County. William Cooper is a very interesting historic character. He knew William Penn, and like many Quakers in England, they were persecuted because of their religious beliefs, and they eventually decided they had to leave. A group of Quakers under William Penn's leadership organized the province of West Jersey, and William Cooper was one of the early buyers. Cooper saw this new land as an opportunity not only for religious freedom, but as a place to build an estate and provide land for his children in the future. In 1680, he came down here to the Camden area and picked a site along the river and bought 300 acres of land there and established the first Cooper home and plantation in 1681. William Penn came the next year and established the site of Philadelphia right across the river. So it's a good place to be. Having close ties to Penn, the proximity of the land he purchased was not by accident and would go on to be the foundation of generations of Cooper Industries. Growing crops and renting land was the primary business of the Cooper family for many, many years. As Philadelphia started to grow, Camden became the primary market for their agricultural products. Other industries established by the Cooper family included fishing, lumbering, shipbuilding, and eventually gaining control of the earliest licensed ferry service in the New World. Until you got steamboat service, it was done primarily paddling through these long oars and horses on a treadmill. And Benjamin Franklin described New Jersey as a keg with taps at two ends, New York and Philadelphia. And before it was Camden, this area was called Cooper's Ferry. It was the tap for all traffic coming in and out of Philadelphia through New Jersey. My next dish is exciting because it was written by none other than Hannah Glass in her book in 1745. And what it is, it's a very complicated, interesting dish using pheasant. And the pheasant itself is stewed in its own liquid until it's tender, falling off the bone. I'm going to first do the stock that I need to cook the pheasant. So now, those bones, which is the bones from the pheasant, you want to caramelize to get the flavor to come out of the bones. All I'm going to add into that is a mirepoix, which is basically carrot, onions, some celery, whatever you want to put in. Only thing left is a couple of bay leaf in there. The flavors from those pheasant bones 
beautiful caramelized, it's absolutely spectacular. White wine for the glazing. You notice I'm using white wine because this dish is not dark, it's more on the lighter side. So white wine is preferred versus red wine. So says Hannah Glass. So the white wine is already in there. I put a little bit regular water because there's so much goodness in those bones to boil out and that's it. We have the pheasant stuck on the fire cooking away. The next step that takes some time is prepare the artichoke that goes with the dish. To clean an artichoke is very simple. You want to cut through here. Some people leave the stem on it for presentation purposes, but we not. And then you go here. And for that you need a serrated knife. Because an other knife is difficult to get through it. The other thing you have to have handy when you cook artichoke is lemon, because it oxidizes really quick. So you want to put lemons on the bottom here. You know, I'm cooking here in the kitchen, it's 300 years old, so the table is wackly, but I don't mind. I'm almost as old. All right, they go into the water behind me. It's always a beautiful sight. I love to cook artichokes. Next, I move the stock off, hip it next to the fire to simmer while I get ready to prepare the pheasant. Thank you so much. So what we do for this recipe, we basically make it into four pieces. So here we go. We go in behind the lake. And pull it down. One. Same thing on the other side. Like so. One, two. We take the wing off because it gets just too dry. And then here, we cut it and actually there's a technical term for that. And people call this an airline breast. And basically what it is, it's, uh, you just go to the contour of the, the breastbone, like so, and you cut right to the end, like so. And you do the other one the same size over here, like that. This is the carcass of the pheasant that we made a stack out of it. I gotta check on the artichoke because they were so fresh and so beautiful. They might cook much faster. How do you check an artichoke? Very simple. The best way I know, you cut through it, bring it out of the stack, and then see if you can peel the leaf. See, if the leaf doesn't peel off, it means it's not done. Here we go. They have about another 15, 20 minutes. In front of me are the two deboned pheasants. So you basically have four legs and four breasts. So all I want to do with them, very, very, very simple, is basically just put in some salt, pepper, good amount of pepper, now we're ready, so I'm gonna take them, put it in my gorgeous flour, pile them right up. Behind me, a Dutch is getting super hot, except this time we don't cook with oil or lard. Too delicate of a dish, so we use butter for this one. See how nice the butter is? Slightly browning, it's just what I want. If you're a fan of the show, you see me using flour very seldom. Because flour and open fire don't like each other. Flour sits to the bottom and burns. But this particular recipe, it's kind of unique and I wanted to follow her instruction. So the pheasant is going to get a little bit more white wine. Next I'm going to top it off with some of the pheasant stock. You see how beautiful the flavor, the strength of this stock. So now all I'm gonna do is gonna lit this one and set it next to the fire. So in Hannah Glass's recipe, she garnished the whole plate with fried meatballs. So I have ground beef in front of me. I have parsley, which I put the parsley right into it. And then I have eggs. The about 10 eggs for this, so it's a large recipe. Get some salilan, salt, we're gonna put some nutmeg in there. Mix it up really good. Go and get a little more of that. If you make this for the first time, you might have a surprise if you make it too dry. Because remember, you're frying them. Frying, obviously, evaporates liquid when you fry. So if you have not enough liquid in there, your bowl's going to be pretty dry. This that doesn't. Here we go. 
up to half oil, never more than that. And I took it also off the fire because I have enough heat. So if you make this for the first time, maybe do a test. And the test is easy. Take one out or make a smaller one and cut into it. This one over here, maybe two more minutes. All right, the meatballs are done. They're sitting right here later to garnish the stewed pheasant. In Hannah Glass's recipe, she recommends a saffron rice pilaf. We're gonna just saute the rice a little bit in oil. So I have some Spanish saffron over here. Now, everybody has a different idea how to use the saffron. I just like the saffron threads. Just add them when the rice is almost done. I got a little, little parsley later in there as well. So the saffron rice pilaf is cooking away. I'm gonna check on the artichokes, get them cleaned, fry up the chestnut and serve the dinner. I remember earlier when I said the artichoke is ready when you can peel the leaf. Now, in Europe, in this is a delicacy. And you dip it in like a sauce hollandaise or in a vinaigrette, and you eat it just like that. Beautiful. We unfortunately not serving that, we're serving just the heart. This is the heart, and there is the flour, and it's hot. Now I'm gonna use a little side towel. Right here, I'm gonna take it off the bottom of the heart. When you wanna make one of Hannah Glass's recipe, you see she's a serious, serious chef. And look at how much detail in there. All we're saving from this is that button. And the rest is all discarded, unfortunately. The artichokes are done, I wanna finish my rice. Now, I happen to like the rice a little uh, more to al dente. Most people don't, and I also love to put parsley on it, because parsley and the saffron makes a unique combination. Beautiful. So the final step of Hannah Glass's 1745 recipe for stewed pheasant is some chopped chestnuts. I want to show you quickly, if you want to use fresh chestnuts, you got to be very careful. A chestnut is like a mini atomic bomb, because what it does, it explodes if you don't know how to penetrate it. By penetrating means you need a sharp paring knife and you want to make a big cross in here. And the reason you do that is that the steam can evaporate out of the chestnut. If you don't do that, it could be in deep trouble. Literally, they literally explode and I've seen it. You can put it in the oven or the other thing you can do, put it in a hot pan. Chestnut roaster, open, open fire. When they're done, you peel them and you just want to chop them. Just really fine chop. It's just a little crunchiness, but right on top, last moment. The other chocks we have, we're gonna cut it in six or eight squares. Yep. Perfect. The other chock buttons are there now. And I'll get some sauce on top. Now, chestnuts are over. I grant you, it looks like a lot of work. But on a rainy Sunday, go for it. Taste history. Re-experience the 18th century with a recipe from Hannah Glass, my fantastic stewed pheasant served with rice pilaf. Experiment with it. Generations of the Cooper family were successful plantation owners in the West Jersey area. However, not uncommon for the times, Maximizing the profits of grand estates like Pomona Hall relied heavily on slave labor and indentured servitude. One member of the Cooper family that has since gained notoriety is Marmaduke Cooper, the great-grandson of William. While not much is known about Marmaduke's character, the value he put on his slaves was evident by the high rewards he offered for the return of those who escaped. Like his ancestors, Marmaduke was born a Quaker. Over time, the religion's unofficial stance supporting abolition evolved into an official doctrine in 1776. There was pressure on any member who owned or traded slaves. Marmaduke, likely realizing that his slaves were critical to the 400-acre estate at Pomona Hall, consistently refused to free them. In 1780, Marmaduke was disowned from his meeting house and barred from the Quaker faith. 
one that had been practiced by his family for over 100 years. As for Marmaduke's slaves, some were eventually emancipated and sowed seeds that now thrive. Upon finding that there were 14 house slaves here at Pomona Hall, and that one of them had been related to me, I was inspired to write a poem honoring their lives. Your very life had to be difficult, but with God's grace, you did survive. And because you lived and learned and loved, today we are alive. Lord knows your path was full of danger and death and evil lingered near. And at times you must have been afraid. But for your courage, we are here. And we shall proudly tell our children of the great sacrifice you made and how this family's heritage began with brave souls once called slaves. So if you made this elaborate meal from before, between the appetizer and the main course, you spend a lot of time in the kitchen. So I'm making an easy dessert for you, which is nothing but a berry with a sauvignon. You can use any berry. I happen to have three berries today, blackberry, raspberry, and blueberry, but any berry would work. So first thing I want to do, I have the berries in the bowl. I'll take a, a sester and just do the zest of a lemon in here, just for the flavor. Okay, lemon, orange is next. That's all we need. Very carefully, mix it under a little bit. Now we got the honey. Some people like sugar to marinate. I personally just like honey. And then I have the cognac, which puts the amount of love in there. Let it sit up. The cognac just brings the essence out of the berries and lemon. And then we're gonna make the sabayon. I'm just separating the eggs, the egg yolk from the egg white. Big questions I get all the time when people see me cooking and say, you use brown eggs, any egg. I just have them like brown, they look better on camera. So do I, don't you think? <laughs> Sugar. Really mix it really good. Then comes the Madeira. Otherwise, it gets too strong at times. Now I'm going to the fireplace to get the Dutch pot with hot water. You can always do this on a double boiler, but in a 300-year-old kitchen, we don't have a double boiler. So we'll improvise. It is hot, but it's beautiful. Now we whisk it. Let's take a little bit to get the, the glass bowl warmed up. Not much longer. In the old days, in fancy Italian restaurants, they would make sapagnone like this on the table side. Madeira just makes it so beautiful. There we go. Just the way I want it. Now, what are we going to do with that? Put it on top of our berries, and we're ready to eat this fantastic dessert. Stick your spoon in there. Wow. What a finale. Spectacular. It's only what I got. It felt good to cook in Pomona Hall today. Even so, it's been a long time I've been here. I love this place. Hot kitchen, nothing I'd like better than hot kitchen and great food like today. From Pomona Hall to all of you for a fantastic taste of history. Thank you.
A Taste of History is made possible by Sandals Resorts, the luxury included vacation. For the past 10 years, I've gotten so many requests for recipes for my show, A Taste of History. Well, now you can find my favorite recipes in the Taste of History cookbook.